uh, good night, good morning, uh, good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in. Uh, this is the first of the academic year uh, of USALI's speaker series. We have weekly events like this, so look for these in your calendar. My name is Jose Alvarez. I'm the faculty director of the US Asia Law Institute here at NYU. And uh, before I introduce today's uh, two very illustrious speakers, uh, which uh, who will be talking about a very recent book. Uh, I, let, I let me just say that next week we at our usual time, which is 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday, the speaker will be Dr. Hao Zhuang, and the topic is public interest and private actors, environment, public interest litigation in China which as you'll see is a, sub, uh, is a subtopic of uh, the big book that we'll be discussing today. So we'll actually be looking at litigation in China uh, for two weeks, uh, starting with today's talk. So today we're featuring uh, Dr. Uh, Waishai uh, Ku, who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Law, University of Hong Kong. Her research focuses on arbitration dispute resolution, private international law, and cross-border legal issues. Uh, she has published widely, including edited books and dozens of articles in leading international law journals, including the American Journal of Comparative Law, the Harvard International Law Journal, the Chicago Journal of International Law, the Vanderbilt Journal, Cornell, uh, Washington, and Northwestern Journals of international law and business. Uh, the book that we'll be discussing is her most recent book, Dispute Resolution in China, Litigation, Arbitration, Mediation, and Their Interactions. It has a beautiful, colorful co uh, uh, cover. Uh, it will also feature in the uh, PowerPoints that our speaker will be showing you. It was published by Rutledge in 2021, I understand. Uh, it is also an ebook available as an ebook, and it has been uh, reviewed uh, uh, by leading international and Asian law journals. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Du is a is a recipient of Hong Kong University's Outstanding Young Researcher Award, Outstanding Teacher Award, and there are not that many people who are both outstanding researchers as well as outstanding teachers. In fact, I used to come from a school that insisted you could only do one thing well, uh, and they preferred that you teach well. And so I had published too much, so that was a bad thing, but you do it all, so congratulations. Uh, she's twice been awarded the Faculty of Law's Research Output Prize, and three times been awarded the top prize by the China Society of Private International Law uh, for her scholarship. Our commentator slash questioner uh, is equally distinguished. Franco Ferrari is a professor of law here at uh, NYU uh, since the fall of 2010. Most recently, he was a chaired professor before then, uh, that is, uh, at the International Law at Verona University in Italy from 2002, 2016, and before that at Tilburg University in the Netherlands and the University of Bologna. Uh, in, inter, uh, in Italy, he has served in government, uh, including in the Italian delegation to various sessions of the UN Commission on International Trade Law and Central, uh, as well as a legal officer at the UN Office of Legal Affairs in the International Trade Branch. He's published over uh, 290 law review articles um, and 25 books. In fact, uh, every time I see Franco, he gives me a new copy. Uh, I don't know how he manages it, but uh, in the past just few months, uh, we have International Commercial Arbitration. Let me see if I get the title in a certain way. Mm -hmm. You can actually see it. Uh, and a comparative introduction. This is with Friedrich Rosenfeld. It has rave reviews uh, from uh, Gary Bourne, among others, in the back. Uh, and then you have uh, a, a uh, forum shopping despite Unification of Law, which is the Hague Academy lectures that he presented recently. Uh, and this is a very inexpensive uh, mm -hmm. paperback uh, that I'm sure Franco appreciates the fact that it gets all over the world because it's cheap, but that doesn't mean he gets that much royalties. Uh, what the presentation will be first by our author of the book, uh, and then Franco will engage uh, in is as typical an engaged conversation. So I turn it over to you, uh, Wesha. 
Um, thank you very much, Professor Alvarez, for your very kind and generous introduction. Um, good morning from Hong Kong. Good evening to audience from US and North America. Um, it's my great honor and pleasure to speak to NYU, um, though it's held virtually. NYU is my uh, Fulbright host. Uh, I've always been treating NYU as my alma mater. It's also my huge honor to have Professor Ferrari um, to be the moderator for my talk today, who has very kindly contributed one of the reviews for my book uh, when I reached out to him last summer uh, and also uh, supported my career growth in the past uh, few years. Uh, now let me pull my uh, slides uh, for the talk today. So um, this is about my book, uh, as Professor Alvarez have shared with you, uh, I have put the book cover um, on the title page of my PowerPoint slides as well. So this is about my book, Dispute Resolution in China, Litigation, Arbitration, Mediation, and Their Interactions. Um, it reflects my research efforts in the few in the past decade or so. So while I'm interested in writing this book, um, I think the background of writing uh, could, could be explained and threefolded. First, it's about China's growing economic commercial importance. Uh, needless to say, China is very important, both economically and politically in the world today. Um, secondly, uh, China's civil and commercial dispute resolution landscape. Uh, what I call is the ecology in the book is not very transparent to the outside world. And thirdly, this ecology keeps on evolving in the past uh, one to two decades. You will see that at the right hand corner of the PowerPoint slides, I have put three circles uh, representing three primary dispute resolution systems um, in this ecology, which are uh, civil litigation, arbitration and mediation. While civil litigation handles both civil and commercial disputes, arbitration in China targets only commercial disputes and mediation handles both civil and commercial disputes. And then these three dispute resolution systems, they cross interact with each other and create the very interesting hybrid dispute resolution system. Well, in the interest of time today, I may not be able to go into the details of the hybrid dispute resolution systems, but if there's interest, I'm happy to discuss what these issues are in the Q&A session. So what is unique about the ecology or what is China, why China is a unique story to tell um, in the civil and commercial dispute resolution study. Uh, through reading my book, you will see that these three circles, uh, these three systems in the ecology, they have very different institutions, very different regulators with very different missions, incentives, objectives, um, motivations, and imperatives. And they have gone through very different reform paths and develop trajectories with very different economic, political, and social contextual factors. And this ecology have been very different or deviated from the international civil justice movements. In order to present a very in-depth study, I have engaged with the official statistics and empirical evidence uh, from China's leading uh, publishers like the China Law Yearbook, Zhongguo uh, Fa Nianjian China Statistical Yearbook and China Arbitration Yearbooks. Uh, when the book manuscript was submitted, um, the most recent decade data was from 2009 to 2018. Now, let me first go into civil litigation um, landscape. Now, in civil litigation um, in China, it includes both civil and commercial litigations. Civil litigation in China is governed by China's civil procedure law, uh, 民事诉讼法, and it's handled by Chinese courts, in particular, its civil tribunals. You will see from the slide that the data on the caseload of China's civil trials shows that the data, I mean, the caseload increased uh, dramatically in the most recent decade and will challenge um, the conventions um, thinking that Chinese people are non-litigious. Actually, it is quite um, um, increasing quite significantly. And the Chinese people, they are more and more resorting to um, the court system for resolving uh, these disputes. Now, what is very worth noting or worth paying attention to uh, in the civil litigation uh, landscape in the past few years is, uh, is the reform to the civil procedure law uh, in 2012 and 2017. The CPL was amended in 2012 and 2017 to introduce the option for social organizations uh, and prosecutors uh, to standing for the public as the plaintiff 
to bring civil public interest litigations, uh, civil PIL is what I put in the book, um, in response to civil mass talks. Um, there are two special types of civil mass talks that have been referred to uh, in the civil procedure law amendment, namely the consumer product liability case and the environmental protection cases. Um, you will see that I provided in the slides in the consumer PIL case, the plaintiff benchmark, um, according to the civil procedure law amendment, is the state recognized provincial level uh, consumer associations. So it is the provincial level xiaoxie. There are around 30 such types of provincial level consumer associations identified uh, by the Chinese government. Uh, there is no nationwide data on the caseload of consumer PIL. What is available here is only the hand-coded data uh, by the civil law scholars. And in 2019, there is a report published by the Chinese leading civil law scholars, and there are altogether nine cases on consumer PL towards the end of 2017. Uh, interestingly, on uh, environmental public interest litigation, you will see that the administrative level benchmark for the plaintiff is set as the city level. So it is the state recognized city level environmental protection uh, organizations, Huan Bao Zhu Zhi. And there are around 100 such type of city level uh, environmental social organizations that can be uh, uh, plaintiff, they are eligible to bring civil public interest litigations. And very interestingly, compared to consumer PIO cases, th there is actually nationwide data on environmental PIO collected by Supreme People's Court uh, in Beijing. According to the SPC um, Environmental Protection White Paper, the environmental PL case has risen uh, very exponentially uh, in the past few years, rising from 58 cases in 2017 all the way to 179 cases uh, in 2019. So it has grown uh, much quickly uh, than the consumer PIL. Now let's take a look about the empirical landscape of arbitration. Uh, this is my favorite area. Now, arbitration in China, as I share with you, targets only commercial disputes. It doesn't handle individual complaints as civil litigation or mediation does. Arbitration in China is governed by China's arbitration law, uh, which was promulgated in 1994, uh, and it's handled by Chinese arbitration institutions, uh, which are called arbitration commissions. Uh, you will see that the data on arbitration uh, shows the growing popularity uh, of arbitration in China, reflected by its rapidly developing caseload here, and then um, significant increase, sorry, significant um, increase in the number of the arbitration institutions reaching 255 uh, uh, at the end of 2018, and then very impressive growth of the disputed amounts uh, in arbitration. What about mediation? Well, um, I have to confess that mediation in China has many different types and initiatives. China has never had a standalone um, mediation law to govern all those different types and initiatives of mediation. So mediation is actually a very scattered uh, regime, I would say. Um, but among those many different types and initiatives of civil and commercial mediation in China, only the people's mediation system has been regulated by a national law, which is the people's mediation law. So this slide is showing you about the people's mediation system and its empirical landscape. Um, the people's mediation system is regulated by the people's mediation law, uh, which was promulgated in 2010 and handled by the people's mediation committees, uh, which I refer to as the PMCs uh, uh, in my book. Um, the data on the people's mediation system, if you look at the left-hand side of the PowerPoint slide, you will see that the caseload of the people's mediation largely leveled off uh, since 2010, uh, when the people's mediation law was promulgated. On the right-hand side, you will see that uh, the number of the PMCs, i.e. the number of the handling institutions of the people's mediation is actually a downward uh, slope uh, and it has declined quite uh, significantly uh, in the most recent decade. Well, in the Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao administration, um, which prioritize harmonious uh, society or he xie shi hui in Chinese, the PMCs, the People's Mediation Committees, they march from as a policy product. When uh, the Chinese leadership changed to Xi Jinping, who is not a big fan of harmonious society and then uh, mediation, PMCs declined uh, quite significantly uh, over the years. 
Now let's compare arbitration mediation as both of them, they're termed as alternative dispute resolution uh, in contemporary literature throughout the world, but are they the same in China? We will see that from previous slides, the empirical results of mediation stand in stark contrast with those of the arbitration. While the arbitration has led to significant increases in both the caseload and the handling institutions, the mediation data is actually on a downward uh, slope. Now, uh, let's take a look at the arbitration ecology first. Well, this is very interesting. So in arbitration, you have a lot of competitions. The 255 Chinese arbitration commissions, the commercial arbitration institutions, they compete on a day-to-day -day basis for caseload. They compete for arbitrators. They also compete for best rules. They update their arbitration rules on a regular basis uh, to compete for best practices. This competition dynamic is even more intensified in 2013 when the dramatic CTAC split incident uh, took place in China. CTAC here refers to the biggest Chinese arbitration institution, China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission, which is the biggest, the oldest uh, that has been in place in China for more than 60 years. But in 2013, the South China branch and the Shanghai branch office of the CTAC, they declared independence uh, from CTAC. Since 2013, you will see that, as I argue in my book, uh, there is an emergence and growth of some key local arbitration institutional players uh, in the market, such as um, the BAC, the Beijing Arbitration Commission, uh, based in Beijing, and the SCIA, the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration, based in Shenzhen, uh, next door uh, to Hong Kong. And what about the actors in the arbitration ecology, um, the arbitrators? In China, the arbitrators, they are deemed as the Rolls Royce uh, in the legal profession. They enjoy high professional decency and respect. They are well paid. Uh, they enjoy decent remuneration. So you see that the arbitration reform has demonstrated very strong marketization and professionalization wave of both its actors and institutions. And this competition dynamic is even more obvious and fierce when the Chinese leading arbitration institutions, they are competing with their regional rivalries, such as those from Hong Kong, the HKIC, and from Singapore, the SIAC, uh, and the BI context. In contrast, when you look at the mediation ecology, well, as I've argued and as I've shared with you, among the many types of civil and commercial mediations in China, there's only one type of mediation that has been legalized, that has been regula uh, regulated by a national law. That is the People's Mediation Law. But the People's Mediation Law and the People's Mediation Committee, they are intended for social stability network. Uh, and this phenomenon is even more intensified by the Grand Mediation Policy Campaign the uh, uh, throughout the 2000s and 2010s. In terms of the actors in the mediation system, the mediators, they took up their mediation work free of charge. They are not paid. Uh, unlike arbitrators, they receive very decent remunerations. Uh, the mediators, they lack occupational security and professionalism. Um, they take the mediation work largely out of their social stability maintenance um, responsibility. So we see that the mediation reform has demonstrated a strong political undertone, which is very different from the contemporary civil mediation reform uh, that have been initiated by non-political actors and motivated by the need uh, just to relieve the court's burden, such as those taking place in the UK in the West, uh, Hong Kong and Japan in the East. So um, in summary, you will see there is a clear divide between the roles and the functions played by arbitration and mediation uh, in the Chinese society. Now, as I've argued um, and as I've presented, um, you will see that arbitration, civil litigation, mediation, the three systems in the Chinese arbitrate uh, in the Chinese dispute resolution ecology, they have gone through very different reforms. Their different reform pathways and contents can only be understood and explained out of their very different political, economic, and um, social contextual factors. Let's look at arbitration in the middle first. Well, arbitration has a quite old law. The arbitration law was promulgated in 1994. This law has not been substantially amended in the past 25 years, though this year, there has been some soliciting of the public opinions uh, for the revision of this law. 
In the past 25 years, this law has remained the same uh, since it was uh, promulgated in 1994. Though it's a very old law from top down, um, um, China has a vi very vibrant market formed from bottom up. The development of the operation has the mission of marketization and professionalization. And it is contextualized in its close connection with China's economic growth and internationalization, uh, internationalization needs. And because the outcome of arbitration has the global enforceability, so arbitration really has the incentive uh, to be aligned with the international standards when they are compared uh, with civil litigation and mediation standards, uh, mediation systems. On the other hand, if you look at civil litigation and mediation, with the social political nature of the Chinese courts and Chinese People's Mediation Committees, um, the reform patterns are largely top down and policy driven. Um, civil litigation reform, as you will see, the public interest litigation, the amendments 2012 and 2017, they are largely um, the top down political reactions towards the serious or devastating mass torts from bottom up, like the San Lu Tink um, uh, incident uh, taking place in, in the late 2010s. Um, and then tr um, in terms of mediation, the people's mediation has social stability as its priority mission, um, and it's not very professionalized and marketized. Now, comparative, infi in, uh, comparative insights on the CJR, on the civil justice reform. This book also provides fascinating comparative perspective. Compared to contemporary civil justice movements elsewhere, where the goals are to improve the efficiency and the quality of disputing processes. For example, by reducing costs, improving case management, or further integrating the ADR methods within the judicial system. The reform agenda in China has largely grown as a social development project, as I've argued in my book, in response to China's economic and societal transformations, uh, rather than as a legal project. And you will see, as I argue in my book, that the reform processes are fragmented and lacks central planning. Uh, you will see that the, the amendment of the civil procedure law has very little to do with um, the arbitration system, if not none. And the arbitration market has no bearing uh, on the mediation system. And the promulgation of the people's mediation law has nothing to do uh, with the arbitration system either. Whereas if you look at UK, Hong Kong, and Japan, the civil justice reform is more holistic. And uh, whereas um, the, um, in Japan, UK and Hong Kong, arbitration, civil litigation, and mediation, they are reformed altogether more um, holistically and in a more interconnected manner. Uh, last but certainly not the least, this book also sheds light on China International Commercial Court, uh, which was very recently established in June 2018 uh, in China. Uh, one of the unique features or selling points of the CICC is a one-stop multi-tier dispute resolution platform intended for the international commercial dispute resolution platform. So you will see that I have also provided you, uh, with you, uh, this is uh, the homepage, official homepage of this one-step platform. Well, this one-stop dispute resolution platform links the CICC with China's five leading what I argue is the five most market-driven arbitration institutions in China. Uh, they are CTAC, the China International Economic and Trade Arbitration uh, Commission, uh, headquartered in Beijing, but, but, but with uh, branch offices throughout China. The BAC, the Beijing Arbitration Commission, uh, based in Beijing. The SCIA, the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration, based in Shenzhen. The SHIAC, the Shanghai International Arbitration Center, based in Shanghai, and CMAC, uh, the China Maritime Arbitration Commission, and the two market-driven international, not domestic, international commercial mediation institutions, which are uh, the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade uh, Mediation Center, CCPIT Mediation Center, uh, and at CMC, the Shanghai Commercial Mediation Center. Both are intending for cross-border uh, mediation disputes. So, uh, the CICC is consolidating uh, the national resources on cross-border um, uh, dispute resolution settlement intending for the BI competition. This one-stop platform uh, represents the latest and most innovative interactions among the three 
uh, DR systems uh, in China today, and also shows China's prioritization of its international commercial dispute resolution capacity building and competition uh, in the BRI context. I think I will stop here and um, uh, thank you very much. I will hand over back to uh, Professor uh, Franco Ferrari. Thank you very much. So thank you, of course. Um, you could not say that, <clears throat> what I'm saying now, but I can. In fact, uh, you have received um, accolades for your book, the book you have just discussed, um, the book that bears the title of today's webinar, namely Dispute Resolution in um, China. For example, just to give one example, by Kong Jiang Kai, who has just published a very positive review of your book in the Chinese Journal of Comparative Law. In that book, sorry, in that review, your book has been lauded, if I remember well, as the first book addressing dispute resolution systems, the three you mentioned, from the prism of a dynamic ecology, which you mentioned, of multiplicity of approaches to dispute resolution. As you made clear now in your presentation, um, your book is a result of, an of the application of a law and development approach to studying the context, the patterns, and the processes of the reform of district resolution, of course, in China. As you say yourself, actually, in the first pages of your book. Now, you inform the reader of the status quo of dispute settlement, um, dispute settlement and resolution in China, why the regimes and institutions are actually created, as Kai in his review points out, how they work in practice, and to where they should go in the future. And you do so by applying, um, as you say yourself, a contextual analysis of dispute resolution studies in China. Now you do show that China has transformed significantly in terms of its domestic politics, economy, which you mentioned in one of your slides, social life, as well as international profile and the desire for having a more relevant international profile over the last few decades. And you were able to show how dispute resolution systems in China have actually adapted to and have been reshaped by China's massive economic and um, social transformation as well. And you do so using empirical data. And allow me to say, even though, as I understand it from your book, this data is not always readily available. So um, one is actually very happy that you were able to find, elaborate the data, um, which you also in part showed us. On page 53, for example, you state that empirical evidence on the entire civil litigation landscape in contemporary China is lacking. Now, this brings me to the first question, to my first question, but I have seen that there is a question relating to statistics also in the chat, which I will then, of course, also refer you to. My question is, why is there no data? Are there specific reasons for this? So this is my first question. And then once you will answer that question, I will um, refer to the question by a member of the audience. Thank you, Professor Ferrari, um, for your comments and questions. Um, it's always a very um, good learning experience when I'm um, communication with, when I communicate with Professor Ferrari. Well, on the empirical data, um, the data that I have been using in my book um, is the data I have tracked from China Law Yearbook, China Statistic Yearbook, and all the available um, um, databases like the Pack University China Law Info. And what is very interesting is I have seen from the China Law Yearbook as well, they only provided the first instance 
uh, civil litigation case law rather than the whole picture. Because in China, you have um, um, the first instance court, which is the district court. Uh, you have the city level intermediate court. You have the provincial level high court and the state level, national level, Supreme Court. So actually you have the four layers court system. But the China law yearbook didn't collect data of entire China. When I chatted with um, the China law yearbook editors, um, it seems to me what I have the impression is that um, the collection work is a very big project and they didn't go through uh, the other layers. Then they just collect the data from uh, the frontier practitioners, the front line. And then the first instance um, court, I mean, the first instance civil trials, where they think this is uh, the best picture to reflect how busy the Chinese civil tribunals would be. Because, you know, obviously, the higher the hierarchical order of the court, the less busier they will be. So by providing the statistics of the first instance civil trials, they think uh, this is the best picture to depict uh, how busy the Chinese civil court will be. Yes, thank you. What you said helps because it is um, perfect to address a question from a member of the audience who would like to know what percentage of civil justice decisions get appealed? So uh, uh, what percentage? Okay, appeal rate. Um, well, I haven't um, studied um, the percentage of, of appeal in the Chinese courtroom. Um, but well, just, just from a normative um, perspective, um, in China, two instances close a case normally. So you have, normally you have the first instance trial and then you have the second instance. So in most of the cases, the second instance is the final instance. You can't have a pew afterwards unless you have very exceptional circumstances that you can reopen a case in limited, very limited circumstances. So I would say, um, well, you, I don't have the actual percentage, but maybe, you know, roughly um, sort of, you know, um, maybe I, I think more or less maybe 50% or a little more than that. Well, I have some experience of the courts in Shanghai, uh, which is my hometown, and for the state, uh, for, for the few visits in Shenzhen, uh, in some of the regions, um, the appeal rate will be higher. But in some of the regions, it, the appeal rate will be much lower. So it's pretty much a... Uh, sort of like case by case analysis in different localities, uh, the appeal case will be very different circumstances. Thank you. And allow me to um, ask a few follow up questions. Again, I take them from the um, Q and A's, meaning um, that I'm looking at uh, what the members of the audience ask, and I try to somehow filter them and try to direct them. This one, I think, from the same person actually, relates to litigation. I say that because later, of course, we will shift to other means of dispute resolution. But mm -hmm. um, the person would like, for example, to know whether there is any data on the percentage of the GDP devoted to litigation. Is there something like that? And how many? And this, again, I'm taking from, of course, the um, question that uh, the person posed. How many jobs are there in the litigation sector? Um, is there data on this, or would you be able to somehow? Uh, well, well, this, this is a very um, good question. Actually, I mean, before I wrote this monograph, I was invited in the comparative course project um, uh, in Asia. Uh, there's the same question how much um, money? <laughs> Uh, how much, how many percentage of the GDP will contribute to the judiciary as a whole and sort of, you know, the litigation, the establishment of the personnel um, and the building of infrastructure of the civil tribunals, that's the same question. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting, you do see across Asia many um, publicity of those data, like in Japan and Hong Kong, even in Taiwan, there's like, you know, less than 1% of 1% something. But in China, there's no such data. Very interesting. There's no such data uh, in the official um, statistics um, or official publicity. Um, when I'm chatting with the SPC justices, it seems that you know um, they are approaching or they are working hard towards you know uh, raising uh, the money that would be allocated <clears throat> that will be allocated from the central level uh, to the judiciary. But uh, it's not really. <clears throat> excuse me. 
it's not really a data that has been publicized by the Chinese government. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so again, I, uh, I acknowledge that there are other questions. I will ask those questions um, at one point, of course, when I think that maybe they refer to uh, different issues as one question that takes into account a more holistic picture based on what you said, and I will ask those questions. At this point, however, um, allow me to switch topic and refer specifically um, to litigation, but not the type we just looked at, in relation to which you also use the contextual approach mentioned earlier. In effect, um, on page 68, mm -hmm. when performing a development analysis regarding litigation, you do state that holistically, the reforms in 2012 in relation to public interest litigation, for example, refinement of summary procedures, recognition, of course, of extrajudicial mediation agreements, and among many other things that you refer to in the book, improvements in the rules of evidence have been seen as responses to change in social and um, economic conditions in modern China. Now, the main driving force is, as you say, China's internal, domestic, social, economic, and social political context. Now, would you be able to expand a little on this? Because you have referred um, at least to parts of these um, statements also in your, in your um, slides, but I wonder whether you can actually expand a little. On the litigation side, I say that because later we'll ask a few questions and I've seen a question relating to arbitration in the chat. Yeah, yes, sure, um, uh, Professor Ferrari. Um, on the summary procedure and then on the recognition of extrajudicial uh, mediation efforts, it's about you know Chinese courts, but what is the background and social economic and social political background here? It is because Chinese courts are overburdened. Uh, there are too many cases um, and Chinese courts on a day-to-day -day basis. Let me give you an example. In Shenzhen Intermediate People's Court, which is next door to Hong Kong, and this is data usually I get because you know it's, it's nearer to Hong Kong. Every judge in Shenzhen need to finalize two cases per day. So altogether, <laughs> In the Shenzhen judiciary as a whole, this is not really the data in 20, 2020 and 2019. That's the data, I think, in 2014, 2015, something. Uh, when I visited them before the pandemic, obviously, you will have the data a few years ahead, back. Um, and then, you know, um, altogether, every judge will have about 700 plus cases every year. So, uh, which means that on average, you need to finalize two cases per day. That is a huge burden on the Chinese judges. And then in the past few years, you do see some brain drain of the Chinese judges. Uh, they have quit their judicial job and joined the law firm, uh, even joined uh, the law school as law professors. Um, it, it's a huge burden on the Chinese judicial intellectuals. Um, so one of the responses from the CPL amendment in 2012 is try to see how we can make better use of the Chinese judges. One way is to introduce summary procedure that, you know, um, so that it's quicker. So for certain types of cases where the disputed amount is not too much or where um, the disputed issue is quite straightforward, uh, so it's quicker. And naturally, you don't need to go through a pew. It's pretty much like in Hong Kong, you have the small claims tribunal. So one, one instance will close a case. So first instance, and that in particular places in China, like Shanghai, the benchmark of the small claims, the summary procedure will be higher, like 10K, 10,000 yuan. But in other places might be lower, you know, because um, the living standard will be very different throughout China. And by recognition of extrajudicial efforts like mediation, it is because, you know, um, there are too many cases. So for those grassroots level, um, civil disputes like the family, um, children's custodian issues, neighborhood issues. So if you have some mediation outcomes, you can go to the eligible court, usually the district level, the lower level court, in the place where the mediation committees, they are, uh, they, they are, they are located, try to apply for recognition 
of the mediation settlement agreement so that it's enforceable. Otherwise, the mediation settlement agreement is just a piece of contract. It doesn't have judicial enforceability. So this is, I think the whole picture, the whole background here is the Chinese courts, they have too many cases and how to help relieve some of the burdens from them uh, so that you design the procedure to help them a bit. Okay, thank you very thank you. much. So one of the reforms and also mentioned on your um, slides relates to the introduction of international commercial courts, which as we all know, have started to pop up a little all over the world. So not just in China, of course. And this so much so actually that these international commercial courts have started to attract attention from practitioners and um, scholars alike. By way of example, this year's plenary session of the SIAC Congress, Singapore International Arbitration Centers Congress, which celebrated its 30th anniversary um, a few weeks ago, focused on the interplay between these international commercial courts and arbitration. And later this week on Friday, the British Institute of International uh, and Comparative Law will hold, of course, online, a conference entirely dedicated to international commercial courts, in which I know you, Wei Sha, are also, of course, participants. Now, from your book, I understand that in 2018, as you mentioned in one of your slides, the Chinese International Commercial Court was established. And this with an aim to improve, if I'm not mistaken, the legal environment for cross-border um, transactions, investment arising out of the Belt and Road Initiative. Would you be able to tell us a little more about this development? And that's mm. the first question. And how these courts relate to ordinary courts? I say that because looking at one of the um, one of the questions posed, somebody else had a similar question. In fact, um, referring, for example, whether to whether disparate ecologies and reform drivers, which you have described arbitration as market-driven and shaped by international needs, and civil litigation mediation as instrumentalist prioritizing social stability, hold in the context of foreign-related disputes and whether the CICC reform constitutes an effort to bridge a gap and to reinforce confidence in litigation in China. Well, sure. Um... Well, first, I, I think I will pick up the question about the relationship between the mm -hmm. CICC and ordinary Chinese courts. Um, CICC is a subsidiary of the SPC in Beijing. So it's, a sub it's, it's part of the Supreme People's Court in Beijing. So the outcome of the CICC, i.e. the judgment delivered by the China International Commercial Court is, delivered, uh, is deemed as the judgment of the Supreme People's Court in Beijing, i.e. it's final. It cannot be further appealed. So why do they design the CICC as a subsidiary of these SPC? The inspiration is from Singapore. Uh, because the Singapore ICC and our common friend, uh, Justice and Samuel Reyes, uh, my mentor at Hong Kong U, uh, he will share more um, on Friday BICO meeting. Um, the SICC, the Singapore International Commercial Court is part of the Singapore High Court. And Singapore High Court is a division of the Singapore Court of Appeal which is the Supreme Court in Singapore. So by having such attachment in the initial days of establishment of the ICCs, either in Singapore and in China, where you're lacking cases, uh, by this internal arrangement, the Supreme Court and the jurisdiction will feed case uh, to its international commercial court in the initial days. I.e., uh, the Singapore High Court, they will pass or they will uh, uh, sort of, you know, transfer certain types of cross-border complicated commercial cases to the SICC. And this lesson has been picked up by Beijing. So what do they arrange is that, you know, if there is a case 
at the supreme level, uh, at the national level or at the provincial level, uh, which is very high level, and you think it's proper to be handled by the CICC, they can pass the case, transfer the case to feed um, the CICC so that they would not be lacking cases. And actually in the past three years since establishment, there's one case and with such referral, there's only one case. Uh, let me report also about the status quo of the CICC, which also relates to one, uh, the first question uh, uh, raised by Professor Ferrari. There are altogether seven cases so far in the CICC, not many, three years, seven cases. So if you compare the data of SICC in Singapore, we are lagging behind. And then for the seven cases of CICC, all of these cases are, um, you know, um, from the Chinese parties. So this is very different from the picture of the SICC where you have the parties chosen SICC from their free will, they're from their party autonomy, which have nothing to do with Singapore from all corner of the world. But all the cases, seven cases are Chinese parties or Chinese parties related. And out of which six cases are related to judicial review over arbitration, i.e. for those five leading arbitration institutions in China identified by the CICC, if the parties they want to apply for judicial review of the arbitral awards delivered by those five arbitration institutions, they will apply to CICC directly. So like CTAG, Shenzhen, Shanghai, Beijing. So six cases are from those five institutions applying for judicial recognition and enforcement. And one case is from what the Guangdong Provincial High Court are feeding the case to the CICC. So this is about the development of part three years and we have already gone the three year period. And then now CICC is promoting itself actually very proactively <laughs> in different professional conferences and roadshow efforts. They are learning a lot from the SICC, even learning from SICC, like how do they build foreign expertise? How do they build foreign expertise? According to the PRC judges law, you can't have foreign judges, right? You can't have the mainland Chinese judges, even Hong Kong judges, they cannot sit on the CICC bench. So how do they circumvent this um, restriction, legal, um, uh, you know, um, this um, legal um, restriction? Uh, they invented um, something called International Commercial Expert Committee. And Selma is there. So what do they do? Is that they say, well, these foreigners, <coughs> they can mediate. They can mediate. And the mediation outcome from those foreigners, they can be converted into a CICC judgment. So I'm very much looking forward to the first case um, from those ICM uh, International Commercial Mediation, uh, International um, Expert Committee member, but so far there's zero. And then Selma is very eager <laughs> to take the case from uh, CICC on the mediation spectrum. Yes, thank you. So, um, we have, of course, a lot of other questions here. And um, let me just refer to one. So apparently Chinese investors have been increasingly subject to commercial arbitration and investment arbitration. Do you think that the Chinese International Commercial Court will be an attractive option for China-related disputes? Or would you think that maybe knowing that, as you just said, there can only be, for example, Chinese judges that maybe there is a bias in favor of the Chinese parties if a foreigner were to start proceeding there? Hmm. That's a very um, good question, actually. I've been asked this question many times in Hong Kong as well. <laughs> and then actually, um, when the CICC was established in 2018, the Hong Kong side, they are very much concerned that the CICC will grab a pie <laughs> in the BRI so that you know Hong Kong status as the leading arbitration and dispute re resolution in, uh, center in the Asia will be um, you know will be shaken. Um, well, I would say that CICC has been established as a major infrastructure um, by the Chinese top leadership for compete uh, for competing in the BI dispute resolution market, but whether they will be as competitive. Um, as the international operation is yet to be seen. Now, firstly, um, the outcome of the CICC is not really globally um, enforceable so far. Well, even though Chinese government has joined the Hague Convention um, 
on the choice of court agreements in 2017, that international convention has not yet been ratified four years later, has not been domesticized, so has not been ratified by the Chinese government, so it's not really effective on any of the judgments delivered by the Chinese courts, including the CICC, which means if you have a US party uh, getting a judgment from the CICC where the enforceable assets is outside China, for example, in Hong Kong, for example, in US, basically you can't do anything. There is no judicial assistance agreement between China and US, um, so basically, um, it cannot mobilize uh, the judgments. That's the first thing. Second thing, in terms of you know um, the judicial bench, um, now the judges are all Chinese. When I say Chinese, it's mainland Chinese. So they have to be judges qualified in China. And so far off the bench of the CICC, they are all the justices from the SPC. They are all the highest level judges at the Supreme People's Court. Well, they are of good credentials. They have received at least one year of legal education in a foreign jurisdiction. And they, they, they can use English fluently. But the thing is that, you know, um, there are still perception. It's not really the case that, you know, they, they might be biased, but there is the perception that because they are Chinese judges, unlike in Singapore, you have judges from everywhere. So there is the perception that they might be more pro-Chinese parties. So having said that, they are aware of the question, they are aware of the issues, what do they do is they try to invite those international commercial expert committee members, in addition to mediation efforts, they also provide some sort of, you know, um, opinions, some sort of like, you know, consultation services. So when the dispute received by the CICC is it's involving some foreign elements, it's involving um, foreign um, um, law, uh, foreign issues, they will invite those uh, foreigners, uh, those who sit on the International Commercial Expert Committee to give opinions uh, and consultation services so that it can mitigate, though not, you know, eradicate, but just try to mitigate some of, you know, uh, the bias perception, right? And then CICC, whether it will be very attractive, um, this is yet to be seen. For the three years time, we have not had any case where parties choose CICC in their contract. And then the benchmark is very high. You have to be 300 million yuan so that you can choose CICC. This is very high benchmark. So you have to be a big dispute and then you're willing to choose. So obviously those need to be satisfied before the CICC will be chosen and there's no such type of case so far. So just a, a comment on what you said before I go on and talk about arbitration. Um, there are decisions now in China as well as in the US that do recognize and enforce a court decision from the other country. So the requirement that um, there be reciprocity today probably is met. I just wanted to say that because we have all heard about the cases about two years ago and a year ago. So there is a little of that going on. Now, let me switch to a different type of dispute resolution, namely arbitration. And there are several questions relating to arbitration in the chat, so I will also refer to those. Would you give us a little background information regarding the development of arbitration in China, including how the arbitration market has actually developed? And I am referring here, of course, to what you call the CETAC split incident. And as I gather from your book, has expanded in China um, where arbitration institutions without the government's involvement actually, as you said, compete with each other, 255 of those, and how this competition affects China as an arbitration market. Um, I say that because in one of the um, questions, reference is made, in fact, to whether you think that new reforms are necessary in order to bring China to a different standard. And because of what you mentioned earlier, there being a new push for a um, 
reform of the arbitration law. In fact, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, it's on 30th of July of this year, 2021, that the Ministry of Justice of the PRC published a draft of the amended arbitration law for broader consultation. There, again, if I'm not mistaken, um, one tries to allow foreign arbitration institutions to establish their operations in mainland China and conduct what is called in the draft foreign related arbitration business. The draft also tries to recognize the concept of place of arbitration, which I'm very fond of. Recognize that an arbitral tribunal has the power to independently rule on its jurisdiction, which in other countries happens anyway due to the competence competence principle, including any objection with respect to the existence or validity of the arbitration agreement. References made there in Article 43 of the draft, for example, to the possibility of an arbitral tribunal to order interim measures, which in some countries still not possible. And actually in Article 91, if I'm not mistaken, references made to the possibility for ad hoc arbitration related, of, related to foreign commercial disputes. Well, thank you, um, Professor Ferrari. Wonderful question. Wonderful questions. Um, well, these are the questions I've been keeping on asking myself in the course of my writing the book. And even after I submitted my manuscript, uh, even after the book was officially published in the past half year, there are a lot of exciting developments um, in the arbitration landscape in China. Now, first going to the Ministry of Justice, um, they are soliciting comments on uh, the re revision of the arbitration law. Well, very interesting. Let me share with you the inside story. Uh, the arbitration law amendment has been um, uh, included in the National People's Congress legislative agenda in the past 10 to 20 years. So um, NPC is national legislature in China. So this law has been in contemplation for amendment in the past 10 years. But in the past 10 years, you see the promulgation and, and amendment of the foreign trade law, anti-monopoly law. <laughs> but every year it has been discussed, but the law hasn't been amended actually. It's after 26 years, almost 27 years, that this law uh, started to be officially uh, recognized to be put into the legislative agenda. And then there are a number of exciting issues being included in this um, legislative draft, like competence, competence, interim measures of protection, ad hoc arbitration, how foreign arbitration institutions seated in China, namely, uh, in particular refer to ICC arbitration in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, is going to be recognized whether this is domestic, non-domestic or foreign. Well, these are the issues which are very important to the further deepening of the Chinese economy in particular. Uh, these are the new sort of, you know, legal issues that have been only appearing all uh, in the past two to three years when the BRI and the foreign trade zone uh, national development strategy has been launched. So for example, like foreign arbitration institution in China, it is not really allowed to be established anywhere in China. They can only be established in the free trade zones in China. So now in China, the free trade zones are in Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, those leading uh, economic centers in China. So what has been allowed is that, you know, those foreign trade zones, you can welcome foreign arbitration institutions uh, to establish some commercial presence. This is pretty much like the WTO trade agreements, like, you know, one of, um, one of the ways that you can, um, you can invest in the legal services is the commercial presence. So now um, it's the ICC, it's the HKIC, uh, HKIAC from Hong Kong, it's IAC from Singapore and KCAB from South Korea. They have established their commercial presences in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, but they can only do marketing. They can only do market. They can do a lot of, you know, promotion activities. They can do lecturing. They can collaborate with the law firms and law schools, but they cannot take up cases officially, according to the Ministry of Justice um, uh, requirements so far. So it is only after the law has been officially amended uh, that these things uh, can be done. So I would see that the arbitration market, the development of the Chinese arbitration market is pretty much like, you know, touching the stone to cross the water where the Deng Xiaoping says. So whether you're a white cat or black cat, as long as you can catch the mouse, you are a good cat. So those Chinese leading arbitration institutions like those in Beijing, Shenzhen, 
they have been touching the water in the past two to one to two decades, 10 years, 20 years, and they have a lot of experiences accumulated. After touching the water, they know how deep the water is, how shallow the water is, and they will reflect their experiences to Beijing. And afterwards, after 10 to 20 years, those experiences will be consolidated uh, in the Beijing draft. And that's how the Ministry of Justice they have come up with uh, in this July. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a related dispute, since we're talking arbitration, and you just described some of these developments. Um, there is a question here in the chat, whether you think that the BRI will have an impact and lead to more reforms in the area of civil litigation, arbitration, and also mediation. Or do you think that, um, for example, the reform or the reason why today, after 20 years, as you just suggested, we finally find a push towards a reform of the arbitration law is triggered also by the BRI. And as I said, by the idea that this may somehow allow foreigners to feel more incentivized to make investments? Mm. Well, that's another very exciting question. Uh, I think BI is certainly a very big incentive uh, for the Chinese dispute resolution institutions to rethink themselves. Well, before the BI, um, well, the legal services market, uh, I mean, the dispute resolution services market is more closed they are thinking about themselves, they are competing domestically. Well, so you will see Beijing competing with Shanghai. Um, CTAC has been split in 2013. So CTAC is competing with the post CTAC split product. So in Shenzhen, you have, still you have the CTAC Shenzhen branch. You also have the post CTAC split Shenzhen Court of International Operation. So uh, they are competing with their former parents. So um, before BI is, pretty much a domestic um, sort of, you know, competitive ecology, but now it's more uh, open-minded. So now they know that in the BRI context, they need to look beyond China. First, they need to look at Hong Kong and Singapore. They also need to look at Europe uh, and North America so that they can gain legitimacy, they can gain a standing in the BRI dispute resolution market. So um, the simple answer to the question is yes, for sure, the BIs bring a lot of, you know, engine uh, to the dispute resolution services market. Having said that, I would say it's more to uh, the more engine to arbitration services market than to the litigation uh, services market, because the institution for the litigation services still the Chinese courts. So you will see that with the exception of the CICC, most of the Chinese domestic courts, they are still politically embedded. They will not be able to go beyond the Chinese border to say, well, uh, today um, a court in Shanghai is going to compete with a court in Shenzhen. And then today a court in Shanghai is going to compete with a court in Singapore or Hong Kong. Because, you know, they are still uh, have a lot of barriers from the Chinese social political um, embedded one. But for the CICC, where the government is intending it to go out, even though it doesn't go out yet, it doesn't have any cases uh, where the parties chose them. But still, they are intending, that Beijing is intending for CICC to compete with uh, Dubai, Singapore. But the arbitration services, they can really go out. Now you will see the Shenzhen, they are already establishing a branch office in Hong Kong. They are very proactive. I would say they are very market alert. They are astute. And they also have very close collaboration called SIAC plus SCIA. So the Singapore International Operations Center will use the premises in Shenzhen if they have any case in Shenzhen uh, and vice versa. If the Shenzhen Court of International Operation, if they have any cases uh, uh, in Singapore, they can use the premises of SIAC. So you will see that, you know, those leading Chinese arbitration institutions, they are very alert on how to grab the market uh, in BRI. Great, Thank at this you. point, um... I wonder whether you could address the regulatory framework in a little more detail, meaning uh, the framework by uh, the arbitration law, which you have referred to, but also what you refer to in your book, the so-called judicial interpretations of the Supreme Court, which, um, if I'm not mistaken, are supposed 
to also shape the regulatory advancement? Yes, yes, sure. Um, well, actually, very interestingly, uh, because in the past 25 years, um, the arbitration law in China has not been substantially revised. So what can be done? <laughs> Um, if the law didn't change, where the bottom-up forces, they can only do some touching the stone to cross the river, but still you need some recognition from the top level. So the Supreme People's Court uh, at the national level in Beijing has been playing a role of normative regulatory development in the past decade. In China, there's a very interesting and unique system where the judicial interpretation uh, called Sifa Jie, is issued by the Supreme People's Court, it's actually de facto law, or we call it quasi-law. Well, it's not really law, but it's, you know, uh, it's binding throughout China. And then it's actually, it, uh, <clears throat> it's actually used as a law uh, in the Chinese courtroom. So in the past decade, uh, because arbitration is, is so closely connected uh, with the market interest, so closely connected with the international um, investment environment. So the SPC has been playing um, a quite active role in trying to fill in the gap of the law because the law was very outdated. According to the law, you will still see, you know, uh, very weird words uh, where you can never see even in Vietnam's arbitration law. So competence, competence is nothing. Um, so where, you know, you still have the division between domestic foreign related arbitration institutions where all arbitration institutions in China, they can take up foreign related case. So th there's no division at all. So you see that the SPC has been uh, doing very diligently, uh, try to fill in the gap um, and the loopholes left out by um, uh, the uh, arbitration law uh, in the past 25 years. Yes. Okay, so um, as mentioned earlier, there is a lot of interest in international um, commercial courts. Earlier, you described the situation in China and uh, how these courts relate to what I call the ordinary courts, and you made this very clear. But what about the relationship between these international commercial courts and arbitration? Can you give us um, a few pointers in relation to whether, for example, that will be the sole jurisdiction or people hope that that will be the sole jurisdiction where certain issues, arbitration related issues will be uh, judged upon? Well, um, I, I think, um, um, well, the main relationship with international commercial courts and arbitration, well, there are two different issues. I mean, China and outside China. But within China, I would say uh, they are competitors but they are also complementary to each other. Well, arbitration needs the judicial support from the international commercial courts. Uh, this is especially so after 2018, where um, the Chinese government announced that um, for Chinese leading arbitration institutions, the five, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, CTAC, and CMAC, their judicial recognition and enforcement will be centralized to the CICC. So you will see that the judicial support has been very high leveled. It's the SPC judges that will review uh, the legality of an arbitral award delivered by those five leading Chinese arbitration institutions. And you will see they're very supportive. And then the enforcement rate is 100%. So they never deny uh, the recognition enforcement. And these five leading arbitration institutions, they have a lot of foreign related cases. They have a lot of cross-border cases. So you see that um, even though China is, you know, has a lot of political issues, social political embedments, but they have never um, stopped their efforts on supporting arbitration. And their efforts on supporting arbitration has been very strong in the past decade. So this is a very interesting dynamic. Um, but we have, to, of course, since you said yourself, only six cases in the last three years. So we do not yet know really how the International Commercial Court will actually deal with arbitration related issues. Yeah, and these, um, well, even though it's only six cases, I would say two cases per year, <laughs> three years. But still you will see that they have clarified some of the leading issues like separability, competence, competence. Well, these are the cornerstone issues um, that in every arbitration jurisdiction they will have no problem with, but they do have problem in China. Like, you know, 
whether an arbitration clause, the validity of the arbitration clause will be severed from the main contract where um, uh, the contractual clause, they are in dispute. I mean, whether it's the formation or, or validity of the contract in, in question, whether the arbitration could be happening or not. Uh, so that's the severability question. This is quite foundation question that should not have any problem in any of the jurisdiction, but that needs CICC to rule on that, to make a very clear signal that it can be severe. And after 2018, everyone knows that, you know, it should be severe so that, you know, uh, nationwide, they know it should be severe and competence, competence by the arbitrators should be, um, should be respected. So CICC is still playing a quite um, sort of like, you know, a pivotal role uh, in giving, um, why, so is the, the lighthouse <laughs> um, and, and some of, you know, the vague or blurring practices that which is very um, scattered among 255 institutions now tell you you should do this, not do that. So it still has a very significant role to play. But as I, I mean, as, as you said, and I agree with you entirely, there are only six cases, so, not 60 cases. So the sample is, is, yes. is too small to make, a to make a conclusion so far. Yeah. Great, thank you. Last but certainly not least, let us talk a little about mediation in China. Mm -hmm. You stayed at one point in your book that the debate around mediation in China has been based on the tradition socialism dichotomy, in mm -hmm. part based on a doctrinal dispute between our own learned colleague, Jerry Cohen, who's in the audience, who anchored mediation in tradition, if I understand it correctly, and Lubman, who considers mediation socialist in nature. You do not necessarily agree with this dichotomy, if I read your book correctly, and suggest that contemporary mediation in China, so of course rooted in Chinese tradition, is based on a um, scattered regime and has developed under strong social political orientation. Um, would you explain this a uh, little more in detail? Yes, sure. Um, well, um, the the Cohen Lutman debate um, took place um, almost fifty years ago. <laughs> that was based on the California Law Review article in the nineteen sixties um, about their very interesting debate, which is still lasting, uh, in fact, on socialism versus Confucianism. So, what is on culture? I think Jerry's argument is more on the culture, where um, um, Lutman's argument is more on um, so, so, sort of like socialist, uh, social political influences. Um, they are still valid arguments uh, that still have a bearing today, but you know, um, the society has been evolving a lot in the past 20 years, especially you know, why mediation um, has been come up as such, as I argue in my book, is that um, you know in the past um, ten to twenty years in the Hu administration, Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao administration, mediation has changed its face. It used to be a very cultural product. It used to be a very socialist project, receiving uh, traditions from Confucianism, Maoist, new Confucianism, new Maoist, and socialist. But now in the Hu administration, it's more on handling social political um, uh, social conflicts. Um, uh, it's more on, you know, how do we handle those um, social conflicts like labor, um, uh, workplace, um, th those very tricky issues that have not been contemplated more than 50 years ago. And then, um, because, you know, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao administration, they have launched a grand mediation policy, which means everything can be mediated. This is very different from the contemporary mediation scholarship in the West, where political disputes I mean, sovereign disputes and then political disputes, they are not really within the ambit of mediation. And then here in the grand mediation um, uh, policy, even constitutional disputes can be mediated. There is a very interesting article by Keith Hand um, and UC Hastings Law School. And then he's arguing that, you know, this kind of, you know, grand mediation um, is largely a policy um, dispute resolution. It's not really the mediation as we understand as an alternative dispute resolution in the civil and commercial sector, but it's largely a mediation of its own uh, in a very unique Chinese um, 
timely context in the Huan administration. So this is not really the thing that um, I think Jerry and Stanley would have thought about um, back to their days. Yeah. Oh, Keith's hand is also in the audience. Oh, I oh I didn't. So um, allow me to ask um, a few more questions because I'm seeing here some questions that the audience is posing, and some of them relate also to um, mediation. So that's why I'm bringing them up now. According to one uh, member of the audience, um, you mentioned that mediation and arbitration pursue rather different goals, warmer social stability or colder commercial um, goals. This is um, what you said and how um, it is put in the question. It is that person's understanding that commercial met up procedures are seen and are more common in China than in many other places. Um, he would love to hear your thoughts on the overlaps between the two, or perhaps an example of their interaction. What are they and how do these two systems clash apart from what you said earlier, um, the consequences of a mediation versus an arbitration, and of course the enforceability, which you have already mentioned. Well, thank you. Um, a very interesting question. Met up. Um, this is also one of my favorite topics <laughs> um, in the past few years. Well, mediation combined into arbitration is a very frequent phenomenon in the Chinese arbitration institution practice, as well as in the Chinese arbitration culture. And it's called Oriental Flower. <laughs> um, what does that mean? Is that, you know, um, as you read my chapter eight, you will see that around um, 40% of the cases, arbitration cases, they're concluded by um, a settlement agreement. So they would go through mediation first um, before arbitration. And then the mediation settlement agreement will be converted to a consent award. And this is very popular practice. But the question here is how do you conduct mediation and the process of arbitration? So in 2010, we have a very famous case called Kinai versus Gao Haiye where Anselmo was um, the hearing judge in Hong Kong, that case was denied enforcement in Hong Kong. This is an arbitration from Xi'an uh, in Northwestern China. And in that case, uh, the mediation combined with arbitration was held over a dinner table in a five-star hotel, Shangri-La. Um, and then there's private caucuses which were not conducted Th uh, through the due process um, requirements. And then finally, there are coercion. So um, very interesting, um, and Selma wrote in his judgment as well, even though it might not really be um, sort of, you know, the due process concerns, but, you know, it, it appears to a reasonable third person, there is actually coercion uh, taking place uh, in the dinner table. And then given that, you know, the final outcome of the award and the initial proposed amongst by the, uh, by the claimant, uh, it will lead to a reasonable third person to have the apprehension uh, that uh, this consent will, has been tainted uh, by apparent bias, if not really actual bias. So we see that, you know, um, med up itself is not really a question uh, for global enforcement. And then now you have the Singapore Mediation Convention that cross-border mediation is gaining more and more recognition um, though New York Convention didn't clarify very clearly how consent award is going to be uh, delineated, but you will see that there's no question or there's no problem of MEDAB itself. But the question here is that, you know, the Chinese style of MEDAB is very artistic. <laughs> Many a time when I share with uh, Jerry, my former advisor in NYU, is that it's, it's pretty much like packing opera. You dance with your own style. <laughs> in your own institutional culture, in your own local culture. So met up in Xi'an will be very lazy fair, like, you know, dinner table Shangri-La hotel, <laughs> but met up in Shenzhen and Shanghai and Beijing uh, will be sort of, you know, very much um, aligned with international standards, especially like in Beijing um, Arbitration Commission, met up will be conducted by different persons. So as long as the parties wish, mediators are mediators, arbitrators and arbitrators. So as long as the parties, they want to change, you can change persons. So there's no concern that uh, the person changing the hat from mediator to arbitrator will have any sort of, you know, um, confidential information that should have been disclosed, but not have disclosed. So there's no question of that. You can change person. 
but this is not really happening in Xi'an or, or, or some, you know, um, hinterland um, provinces. So it's a very different picture in China. Going back to 255, this is not really um, a, a very balanced competition. What well, some of the Chinese operation institutions, they grow very well, but not all of them. You have different tiers. Uh, you have first tier, second tier, third tier, even fourth tier. So um, this 255 arbitration commission market has made possible for some role players to, to, to grow ahead, but not everyone has grown ahead. So I think the change of the law is trying to make it a bit even uh, so that you know some backward arbitration institutions, either you are eliminated from the market, there's no need for you to stay on with it, or you don't have any cases, or you know try to boost a bit for the second tier, like in the, those in Hangzhou, so that you know you can play a bit better. Oh, allow me to say something on something you said now. Consent awards in the New York Convention. Now let's be very clear: the New York Convention does not necessarily allow for consent awards to circulate because the New York Convention in Article One requires, as we know, that there be a dispute. So obviously, if the parties initiate arbitration proceedings and then during the arbitration proceedings get to a settlement. There is no problem for that settlement being transformed into an award and that award circulating under the New York Convention. The problem is, however, if the parties settle the case prior to initiating arbitration and some do that because of course they think that the arbitral award can then circulate under the New York Convention. But I think that the Article 1 requirement that there be a dispute to be decided doesn't exist anymore. And we know that there are cases that where, in my opinion, correctly the courts refuse enforcement of a consent award where the consent existed prior to the initiation of the arbitration. Um, but that's one view. And so um, let's go ahead with some other questions. And Okay, so yes, one of the participants says that, uh, of course, um, that um, that person is wondering whether Shanghai is developing in the field of international arbitration from your perspective. I think you made it clear that a lot is going on there, um, of course, and that that person thinks that um, there is change, but I think you made this clear um, that there is change in that respect. Another person refers to, for example, transnational and foreign court torts and would like to know whether the um, International Commercial Court also has jurisdiction over this type of claims, not just contracts, which we probably all have in mind when we talk about arbitration mediation. Well, uh, I think it's excluded. Uh, tort dispute is not really considered commercial um, uh, in the SPC guidelines on CICC. <clears throat> uh, CICC does have um, a broad definition of commercial, but it's not really including uh, tortious disputes. But we have a very interesting debate about investment disputes, um, which, I mean, Frank and I, I like, you know, investment arbitration. So how CICC is going to play a role when you have a state um, investor dispute and whether this kind of dispute would be able uh, to be submitted to the CICC. Well, it is being considered by Beijing. Uh, certainly, uh, China this year, very interesting this year, uh, they are more active in exit. <laughs> China has become both a claimant as well as a respondent and exit um, cases, which has never been so in the past 20 years <laughs> since uh, China joined the exit convention. And then even though there are about seven cases, two out of which are from Hong Kong and Macau <laughs> before. So um, you will see that China is taking a more active role in the investment treaty arbitration. But whether CICC can take that dispute is really a question mark. And then from certain um, officials um, from CICC, I mean, the, the, uh, the CICC justices, they have different opinions. Some wish to open, but some are more um, sort of, you know, reserved on this issue. They think, you know, you should go to exit or you should go to um, investment treaty arbitration ancestral uh, do not come to China, or you can go to CTAG. CTAG has um, their investment arbitration rules 
and Shenzhen, Beijing, all those leading arbitration institutions, they have promulgated their investment arbitration rules as well, but they are waiting for the case to come. But still, they don't yet have a case so far. Um, since you referred to those cases, um, China has actually settled also some of the cases. So that is an interesting way um, of dealing with things. They say that because a lot of other players, repeat respondents, for example, for a long time have avoided to settle cases. Um, is there a reason or do you have something in mind why this could happen or why this has happened? Well, I, I, well, I, I think um, I, I refer to one of um, the articles published in the Chinese Journal of International Law. So, you know, I, I think this is pretty much an inertia. It's the mindset um, of mm -hmm. the Chinese government that they are uh, more inclined towards settling sovereign disputes than having really a judicial decision. Um, whether from arbitration, from ICJ, et cetera, even for South China Sea arbitration. I mean, so you will see this is pretty much a, a, a mindset issue. It's not really today that China doesn't have the capacity to join those litigations. You have those red circle law firm, and then you have those lawyers who have received um, a lot of foreign education who are qualified. But the thing is that, you know, it's the inertia that um, they do not want to have a final win-lose judicial decision, and they are more inclined towards having a settlement, which I think um, also partly explained by Confucianism in the international setting. Um, it's, it's more face carry, I think. Great, so thanks a lot. So um, one question relates to whether many cases go to mediation. Um, because the uh, person asking the question thinks that why do you have to go to um, litigation if the mediation system works? Does it really work, um, the mediation system? Well, as I said, um, as an argument in the book, mediation has many types. Um, you have to refer to what kind of mediation you are going to. And then you have to bear in mind that the outcome of mediation it's not really enforceable. Well, so um, if you say, well, uh, if mediation is cheaper, it's more accessible at a gr grassroots level, you have to care about the enforceability issue as well. So for people's mediation system, this is the only mediation system in China which has a national law and which is only has, uh, th this is the only mediation system that has been linked with um, civil procedure. They're, they can recognize the extrajudicial mediation uh, settlement agreements. You can go people's mediation. Uh, you can apply for judicial recognition um, and enforcement. But the th thing is that, as I argue and uh, as I have um, presented today, people's mediation, the mediators, they took up the word free of charge. So um, you will see that it's largely a, a social stability network system. And then you will see that the numbers of the people's mediation uh, centers, they are declining in number. And it's not really something that people are a big fan of. But on the other hand, if you look at the commercial mediation institutions, especially the cross-border commercial mediation institutions mm -hmm. like the CCPIT or the Shanghai Commercial Mediation Center, they are doing well, but there are not too many in China. Very few has gained domestic, regional, and international recognition. I think it's pretty much only the CCPIT that has been recognized by James in the US. Other things are largely unknown and they largely lazy fear themselves. Yeah. Look, um, thank you um, for this. It is, I think, nearly time to wrap up. So allow me to thank you for this discussion um, you and I had, and I'm very glad to have been invited, of course, by the Institute to discuss your book, which is, of course, a great book with you. Thank you so much, Professor Ferrari. It's my huge honor. Thank you both on behalf of uh, Uzali, and I hope to see you both back in a future event. Thank you all. Good Thank night. you so much, Professor Alvarez. I really appreciate that. I look forward to, to catching up with both of you soon again. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.